Chapter 2 is where we're headed, folks. Page 1554, if you're using the church's Bible in front of you. Otherwise, I invite you to open your phone, open your Bible to Mark chapter 2. We're going to read verses 13 to 17, just a short section today about the calling of Levi. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting up at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we are only into the first few weeks or possibly months of Jesus' public ministry, and already it seems that the doors of these local synagogues are being shut to him. The Pharisees, who were, of course, the guardians of Jewish orthodoxy, uh, were starting to declare uh, their own kind of war on Jesus to the point where he was beginning to be banned from his opportunities to speak publicly in some of these local synagogues. And that forced Jesus then to take his teaching out into the countryside. Now, it wasn't uncommon for a rabbi to uh, do open-air teaching. It was a fairly common practice for rabbis to uh, stroll along the, the Sea of Galilee or walk the dusty roads around Capernaum or wherever it was uh, with a group of disciples following behind. In the end, it probably didn't bother Jesus a whole lot that he was forced out into the streets and the villages because that gave him contact then with the kind of people uh, that he was really looking for. As he said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came for sinners, came for the sick. Uh, let's do some quick geography. You might be interested to know that Palestine uh, was really... Uh, or the, the area that we know as Israel and Lebanon today was really a land bridge between Europe and Africa. Uh, let's, let's take a look at this map here. The, the details are not real great, but let me uh, just use this little uh, thing here. So, yeah, we've got Europe of here, uh, Afri Africa here, uh, present-day Israel and Lebanon here. And if a person didn't uh, want to, for example, they were scared of uh, sailing on the sea, uh, or, or if they didn't have the money to do so, um, to go across the Mediterranean by ship, uh, let's say from Egypt uh, to Rome or other parts of Europe, uh, they would be forced to, to really direct their commerce, commerce then around this land bridge through the Middle East. And uh, so what we have here are a couple of primary roads in the ancient world. Uh, the first that you see in yellow here is called the Great Road of the Sea. Um, it, it really kind of worked its way all the way around here, but let's just start up here around Antioch, uh, right along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, down through Sidon and Tyre and Caesarea, through Philistia, and then on into northern Egypt. Uh, this is called the Via Maris. Uh, literally the way of the sea, um, and the road actually makes its way all across the coast of the Mediterranean to Alexandria, to Cyrene, on over to Carthage and beyond. Now running right parallel to that ancient road is another road which is called the King's Highway, which cut its way right through the middle of Judea, right through the Jericho, Jerusalem uh, area. Uh, we go up here into D uh, Damascus uh, in Syria, and then right straight down through the wilderness territory south of Jerusalem on into the Sinai Peninsula and Lower Egypt. 
we know that Jesus spent a fair amount of his time, uh, especially along this highway, the King's Highway, doing his teaching because that's where there was so much travel. There were so many people. And as we've seen in the Gospels already, um, Jesus drew enormous crowds, and Jesus wanted to have enormous crowds to get the message of the kingdom, the message of repentance out to folks. Um, but that's really not so much the point that I want us to see this morning. Um, the thing that I think it's important for us to see is that Jesus would have loved to have carried out at least a significant portion of his ministry in and through the synagogues. That was the place where people gathered, as we do this morning, uh, for teaching about the things of God. That's where the law and the prophets might be expounded. Um, so Jesus would have liked to have carried out some ministry uh, in the house of the Lord. It is the house of the Lord, after all. But sadly, the Son of God is not welcomed in his own house. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think that that can happen today? that the Son of God would not be welcomed in his own house. I want to tell you that it can happen and that, it, in fact, it does happen. Over my 30-plus years of ministry, I have begun to see God move and work in people's lives and in the church. And because God's activity does not fit with people's expectations or does not allow them to stay comfortable, uh, they begin to resist him. They may begin to even push God away and close their hearts to the moving of his Holy Spirit. But scripture warns us, do not grieve the Spirit. Do not spurn. Do not resist the Spirit of God. Paul commands the Thessalonians, do not put out the Spirit's fire. I've seen it happen. Maybe you've seen it happen among good solid, church-going folks. It happens probably more times than you and I would care to admit. The Old Testament, of course, gives us all kinds of examples of uh, God being rejected by his own people, by his chosen people. And because they refused him, God very politely turned away from them. He is a gentleman. Uh, he's not going to force someone to worship him, force someone to love him. But there is a terrible price to pay, friends, for disregarding the Lord and his Holy Spirit. Do you remember when the glory of God departed from the temple? It's found in Ezekiel chapter 10. It would be a good passage for you to read sometime soon. Uh, if you recall the story, the cloud of the Shekinah glory of God literally re was removed from the temple. You could see the cloud of the glory of God departing from the temple. God removed his presence. He removed his blessing because of the stubbornness and the closed-mindedness of his people, the, the, the disobedience of his people. Now, one of the main things that can God, cause God to, to wipe his hands of us is an attitude of pride and of self-righteousness. Pride does not allow us to admit our own wrongdoing, which is why it's so important that each Sunday we take time in our worship to confess our sins, to acknowledge, yes, I've sinned. Yes, I need God's cleansing. But pride does not allow us to admit our own wrongdoing, and it keeps us thinking, well, you know, other people sin, but, but I don't sin, at least not that much. Jesus illustrates that point in the story that he tells us about the Pharisee and the publican, remember? The Pharisee stands on the street corner and says, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men. And the publican stands at a distance and beats his chest and falls to the ground in humility and penitence, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Self-righteousness, self-justifying behavior can kill our relationship with other people. You've probably experienced that before, seen that before. But it can also kill our relationship with God. It essentially announces to God, I don't need your help. 
I can help myself. Don't need your righteousness. I've got a righteousness of my own. Sadly, buys into a deception that Satan wants us to believe, that we are righteous, that we are somehow inherently good people, and we do good things. It forgets those words of Isaiah, the prophet, who said that all of our righteousness, that is with no exception, our righteousness is like filthy rags before the justice and the holiness of Almighty God. Well, let's move on and look at this person, Levi. Levi, most scholars agree, is the disciple Matthew. In fact, in Mark's next chapter, when the 12 disciples are listed there by name, uh, we see that there's, uh, there's a Matthew mentioned. Luke, or I mean Mark 3, verse 18, tells us there's a Matthew, uh, but there's no Levi even mentioned. So what happened to Levi? Did he join up and then he quit? Uh, what happened to him? Well, Levi just has another name, which actually was fairly common in those days. We think about Peter. Jesus called him Simon. Other times called him Peter. Sometimes he used both names, Simon Peter. And so we believe that Levi is the same man as Matthew. What we need to understand is that this Matthew was a hated man. A very hated man. The Jews despised all of the tax collectors, of course, because they not only were taking their money, they were working for the government. Not that everybody who works for the government is evil, but they were working for the Romans. Judea was a Roman province, so Matthew and all of his uh, cohorts were collecting for the enemy. One of the problems with these tax collectors is that people never knew exactly how much they were going to have to pay. When you and I get our property tax bill, we probably know pretty much to the penny what it is we're on the hook for. When we buy something at a retail store and we have to pay the, the state sales tax, we know pretty much how much we're going to have to pay. Many of us probably have a pretty good idea what our income tax is going to come to for the year as well. But these Jewish uh, tax collectors extracted from people uh, as much as they could get them to pay. They were required to give a certain amount of money to Rome, uh, a mandatory amount, um, and everything beyond that that they could collect, uh, they could keep for themselves. So they could gouge people and line their own pockets with the difference of what they had to give to Rome. So they are really professional extortionists, destroyers, who rob people of their living. And people hated them with a passion. They would avoid them on the street. Uh, they would refuse to have anything to do with them. You would never eat with a tax collector because they're wicked. But now Jesus invites this robber this extortionist named Levi to become one of the inner circle of his followers. Several years ago, Pixar Films came out with a movie entitled Ant Bully. The movie revolves around a little boy named Lucas uh, who has a great fascination with destroying ants and ant colonies. He terrorizes ants wherever and however he can. But one day, the queen ant, as the story goes, comes up with a magic potion that reduces Lucas, the little boy, uh, to the size of an ant. He literally becomes as tiny as an ant. And at one pivotal moment in the film, when it appeared the entire ant world was determined to get even, even with Lucas and torture him to death, for all of the misery that he had visited upon their colony, the queen ant silences her angry mob and says this, we could destroy this human and make us safe this day, or we could change the nature of this human and perhaps create a brighter future for all ants. And so the queen decides to put Lucas to work, training him to learn the ways of ants and to even develop a heart for ants. 
Now, I tell you this illustration because that is precisely the kind of thing that Jesus is doing with Levi to help him uh, to come down to the level of common people and to understand their plight and their needs and to have his own heart changed uh, so that he could create a brighter future for all others. But I want us to imagine this morning what was going on in the minds of the other disciples when Jesus calls this wretched tax collector to be part of their holy band. And shockingly, Levi actually gets up, leaves his job, and follows. That was a surprise to them, I think. If these disciples, who are Jewish, are like most of the other Jews of their day, they probably wanted to kill this man. We don't know if they ever said such a thing, but I'm guessing that they probably wanted to say to Jesus, Are you kidding me? To invite this man into our holy group? What are people going to think of us? But Jesus didn't care about the opinion of the masses toward his new church or the opinion of the 11 disciples. Jesus wanted this man. He wanted Levi. A man that nobody else perhaps wanted. A man that maybe nobody else loved except his own parents. He wanted to make something of this man's life. And so he offers him his friendship and a new way of life. And the point of all of this is that Jesus cared about lost people. He said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. The lost. Friends, that is the kind of church and churches that we need that we must be. That is why I believe that every ministry, every program, every service at Forest Grove Reformed Church should somehow in some way hold forth the opportunity for people to commit themselves to Christ. You may get weary of hearing it from the pulpit. You may deny its necessity. But can we honestly question that that's the right thing to do? You see, there comes a time when every pastor and every church member has to make a decision about whether or not they will do what is right according to the Holy Scriptures and according to the heart of God, or they will do what is expedient and allows them to keep peace with other people. The Apostle Paul and the Galatians had to face this in their church, if you recall. There was a group of people, Jews, called the Judaizers in the church at Galatia that were pressuring the other believers to make circumcision a necessity for anyone who was a new believer. Any new convert, a follower of Jesus, had to be circumcised according to the Jewish custom. But look at what Paul wrote to them at the beginning of Galatians in Galatians 1 verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let me paraphrase that last line. If I'm just here to try and satisfy you, I would not be faithful in serving my Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, that attitude should characterize every person who ever comes to serve as your pastor, ever comes to be a member of your church staff. You should not want a shepherd of your soul who will sugarcoat things for you and refuse to tell you if they see you living in disobedience to the word of God. You should also expect and insist on people who serve on the board of elders who will carry out such biblical discipline towards pastors and other church staff and other members of the consistory towards any of our members if they somehow see us disobeying the word of God, living in sin. Anything less than that is enabling, isn't it? 
is surely not Christian love. But why should we have that mindset? Let me ask. Why should we have that mindset? Why should we carry out that kind of tough love towards each other? It's based on a biblical principle. Following Jesus means giving up your former way of life and giving up your own preferences. Jesus said, whoever does not lay down his life and take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of being my disciple. Listen to Hebrews 10.26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. 1 John 3.9 puts it this way. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. There's a cost to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And it, it involves a radical departure from your former way of thinking and living. There is no doubt in my mind that of all of the disciples that Jesus called to himself, at least of the, the 12, that Levi, and let, let's just call him Matthew now, gave up the most. Peter and Andrew, James and John, perhaps others of the 12, uh, could go back to their fishing. In fact, in John's gospel, it tells us that after Jesus died, that's exactly what they did. They went back to fishing. But Matthew burned his bridges completely. We don't know how much Matthew really knew about Jesus of Nazareth before this encounter in Mark chapter 2, but he staked everything on Jesus in this moment. Everything. Everything. With his decision to follow Jesus, Matthew put himself out of a job forever. At least that job. Because in first century Palestine, you didn't just go back to being a tax collector if you were one and then decided not to be one. Because the Romans would never trust you after that. The words of that song, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, were absolutely true in Matthew's case. This was a huge decision for Matthew, but it was the best one he ever made. And as we come to a close this morning, let me invite you to think about three things that Matthew got from making this decision to follow Jesus. First of all, he got clean hands and a clean heart. From now on, he could not only look the world in the face, but he could look himself in the face, other people in the face, with no shame. He was probably a poorer man. I don't know that for sure, but I think it's a pretty safe assumption. His life may have gotten much tougher in many respects. We believe he was martyred, like most of the disciples were. But because he became an honest man, like Zacchaeus, another story of note, his mind could be at peace. And how much is that worth in life? What's that worth? How much is it worth to begin respecting yourself and loving yourself? Jesus can give us that. He's the only one who can. Secondly, although Matthew lost one job, he got a bigger and a better job. One commentary author said that Matthew lost everything except one thing, and that is his pen. His pen. As a tax collector, Matthew obviously had to be a good keeper of records. He had to document uh, every uh, date and manner of his encounters with people that he was going to collect his tax from. He had to have an orderly mind. He had to have a systematic way of working. And Jesus knew all of that about this man, saw his God-given ability, and saw what he could give you and me. And what was that? It was the first book of the New Testament, the gospel according to Matthew. It's a marvelous account of the teachings and the events of the life of Jesus Christ, and it's written specifically to a Jewish audience. 
which Jewish people who read the Gospel of Matthew today bear witness to in ways that they don't grasp when they read Mark, Luke, or John. Uniquely Jewish. Third and most important, Matthew got to have a personal relationship with the Son of God. You know, Jesus called people to a relationship with himself, also with the Father in heaven, with the Holy Spirit. But he didn't call people to a relationship with an organization or with a body of doctrine, with a catechism, or with a bunch of rules and regulations. Jesus wanted Matthew to know him. And he wants you to know him. If the only Jesus that you know this morning is the Jesus preached about by preachers and talked about by, by Christians or, or you read about in, in uninspired books, extra biblical books, you're missing the real excitement. Jesus wants us to know him, to walk in intimate fellowship with him. And until you have Jesus filling your soul with his love and, and, and your, your heart is, you know, seated on the throne with Jesus, you're not experiencing this life that Christ came to give all those who put their trust in him, this abundant life, which, which is like a spring of water welling up inside of a person. So this morning, I, I simply want to close by, by doing what Jesus did with Levi in this story. And that's just, just say, come and follow. Come and follow Jesus. You don't have to follow Forest Grove Reformed Church or some other church. You don't have to follow some body of doctrine or theology. You need to follow Jesus because there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we might be saved. Jesus. It's our only hope. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes to God except through me. Lord, that was a very exclusive claim, a very particular claim. And we trust the truth of it because you are God and you cannot lie. You do not deceive. So, Lord, I pray the full truth of that statement and all the statements that you made for us in the Gospels will come to bear upon our hearts and our souls today as we consider your invitation to leave the life that we are living and to take up the life that you offer us. Lord, we need you. I need you. I cannot save myself. No human being can. As that verse says, there is salvation in no other name, through no other way. It's only through you. And so, Lord, we turn to you this morning, and we ask you to receive us. We know that you do because you love us. You came for us. You died for us so that we could know you. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us not to settle for knowledge about you when you want us to walk in an intimate relationship with you, to really know you, and to have your spirit dwelling in us, giving us life like we could never experience through any other way, so far beyond anything that this world can offer. So, Lord, we look to you this morning and we pray that you would come into our hearts, that you would have mercy on us, that you would hear the cry of a humble sinner. Lord, I know that I've sinned against you, but I repent today. I want to turn away from my sin and I want to invite you to come fully and mightily into my, my being to fill me with your Holy Spirit, to cleanse me of all my unrighteousness and to give me your righteousness and make me your own child, full of your life, full of your love, full of a desire to worship and love and serve you all of my days. God, that's what I need. That's what I desire today. 
So hear my prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. Save me. Forgive me. I call you my Lord, my Savior, from this day forth. And Lord, for those of us who have known you, who made a commitment to you perhaps years and years ago, but our love has grown cold, our passion for you has, has withered, would you refresh us on our way? Lord, would you hear our prayer to, to be dedicated in a fresh new way to you this day? That we might serve you with the kind of joy and enthusiasm and abandon that we had at the first. Lord, it's so easy for us to lose our first love in this world where the flesh and the enemy and the, the, the world is all around us and coming against us and, and, and working against us to, to keep us from you. But Lord, we know that once we truly have you, that you dwell in us and you have said that none who do that will be snatched from the Father's hand. So Lord, we thank you for that comfort, for that great assurance that you give us. But Lord, each of us must confess that we need you today. So hear our prayer. And Lord, thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for loving us unconditionally, everlastingly. And we pray it through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you made a decision for Christ in those moments, I would invite you to speak to myself or Pastor Doug or Todd or one of the elders about what it means to walk with Christ, to be in relationship to him, how you can grow in that relationship and uh, become a mature follower of Jesus. Um, that's what we're here for, is for that journey and to do it together. None of us does it perfectly, um, but thank the Lord we don't have to. He uh, lives his life through us.